Well, hello and welcome. Uh, if you're new or if you haven't joined us for a few weeks, we're in a short series on Micah 6, verse 8. And this is the third within that series. Let's just start by looking at that verse again. This is our seminal verse for these three talks. Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So that's quite a familiar verse, I'm sure. But um, we've been looking at them in turn. So two weeks ago, Gareth um, brought us um, a talk on acting justly. And it was a really, a, a really powerful call to own right and wrong in a world that doesn't know what's right or wrong anymore, in the words of Lily Allen. That song really stayed with me that week. But, you know, that sense of just being proud that we have the Bible, we have the Word of God on which our laws of right and wrong are based. And that's something we should be proud of and we should own. And then last week, Andrew spoke to us about loving mercy. And the thing that really stayed with me from last week was um, the fruitcake analogy. So um, Andrew was saying, it's not, this verse is not like a layer cake, where you might have one person who's good at acting justly, one person who's brilliant at showing mercy, and another person who obviously walks humbly. But that actually, mature Christians should be people who are all three of those mixed in. So we shouldn't really take them one in turn, but have them all together. And I think the church has really struggled with this idea, hasn't it? You know, especially with that contrast of acting justly and showing mercy. You can all think probably of churches that are really big on justice. You know, you can imagine those placards with repent, you know, before the coming wrath. Uh, those sorts of things. Hell, fire and damnation sort of preaching. But on the other hand, and perhaps more so in our culture, we do have more of an overemphasis perhaps on showing mercy. And sometimes we, you might have seen that the church has fudged issues of justice. You know, there's been many church leaders, haven't there, been coming under scrutiny recently for allowing issues of child abuse to go unnoticed, undealt with in their churches, in their parishes. And that is unjust. And that's not the, the, the person of God. That's not the character of God. He is both acting justly and loving mercy in one. And I thought it was a hugely powerful moment last week when we just meditated on the cross. And I think it was something we needed to hear was that on the cross, it wasn't that God's mercy trumped his justice. It was perfectly just and perfectly merciful altogether. And that's because God came in human form. It was him actually undergoing his own justice, suffering under his own wrath. He, he drank the cup of suffering. He drank his own wrath. And that is justice. But what motivated that was the great mercy of God. He wanted to show us mercy. So it's really important not to think that God's forgiveness is, is a sort of brushing sin under the carpet or turning his back, or forgetting sin. He didn't. He paid for it perfectly with his sacrifice. So it was completely mixed together. And that's why the fruitcake analogy is so helpful. It's where you have lots of ingredients, or maybe just a few ingredients, all mixed together. So I'm going to run with that idea today. And just in case you don't know, here is how to make a fruitcake, part one. we're going to show you how to make the Duchess of Cornwall's fruit cake. It's really delicious and extremely easy. First, you brew a cup of tea in a mug with two tea bags. Other brands are available. Pour it into your bowl, tea bags included, and discard. Here I have my chef, Gilberto. Oh, no. <laughs> um, Gilbert is going to pour in one bag, 500 gram bag, of mixed fruit, including peel. Go slowly, Gil, so it doesn't slop. Good man. Wonderful. I need to Great. 
and this is my other assistant, Lorenzo. Say hello, Lorenzo. Hello. Lovely. Now, can you add half a mug of light brown sugar? The recipe says one whole mug, but I just use half. Tip it all in, Loz. Wonderful. And stir. Ah, uh, yeah. And all that's going to happen is that tea is going to soak into the mixed fruit and the sugar overnight. So tomorrow it will all be absorbed Mommy. and we'll be ready to bake a delicious fruit cake. <laughs> yeah, thank you. The boys really enjoyed doing that. And, um, we have got part two coming up, so keep that in mind. <laughs> but um, that is, I am actually really excited about that recipe. Um, it's so easy. And what's good about it is that you get a really moist fruitcake. There's nothing worse than a dry fruitcake. It's really nice and moist, but without any butter or oil or even booze, which is great, but not so great with kids. <laughs> So it's a really nice moist fruit cake. But the other thing is that actually making the cake is really easy because you have soaked the ingredients. And in the same way, walking humbly is easy or easier if we regularly soak in some foundational truths. So we're going to go now to Ecclesiastes 5, verses 1 and 2. This is sort of the seminal passage for, for this morning. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. Now, I wonder if you can remember a time when you thought that the sun revolved around the earth. My kids certainly did. And it's something we just grow up with. It's something we just assume. It looks as though the sun rises and falls. But at some point, someone explained to you that the earth revolves around the sun and not vice versa. And it might have been quite a hard truth to grasp. And we might have had to continually sort of correct our knowledge or our understanding of the world. And in the same way, we are born with an inherent belief that the world revolves around us. And if you don't believe me, just go over to the kids' work over the road and the creche and just see how the children interact with each other. I remember hearing about a little boy called Oscar, who was about four, and he'd just been, sort of, he felt saddled with a young baby sister called Ruby. But to make it worse, the Kaiser Chiefs were number one with Ruby, Ruby, Ruby. And his parents said that in the end, he just suddenly stood up and went, it's not fair, Ruby's got her own song, where's mine? <laughs> and, and I think that it just reminds me of those verses in Corinthians. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. So to walk humbly, we need to grow up and we need to recognize, I need to recognize, that the world does not revolve around me. To walk humbly, we need to be aware of our place in the world in the great scheme of things. We need to know that we matter little enough that the world does not revolve around us. But we need to know that we matter enough that we don't need it to. I'm actually just going to repeat that again, because I think that's important. That's something I feel the Lord has said for this morning. We need to know that we matter little enough that the world does not revolve around us. But we need to know that we matter enough that we don't need it to. In C.S. Lewis's um, lesser known book, Till We Have Faces, A Myth Retold, there's a bitter old woman called, called Orwell. And she spends the latter half of her life storing up and rehearsing her complaints against the gods. And when finally they send for her and she's allowed to speak, she begins confidently. But the words of her complaint don't sound the way they do in her head. Her voice sounds different. Everything she says just sounds less reasonable than she had thought it would. And she realizes that her complaint 
is just going on and on and on. And she's just saying the same thing over and over again until finally she just trails off. And from the silence, a voice speaks. And it says simply, are you answered? And she realizes that being in the very presence of the deity is enough. And C.S. Lewis wrote later of the book, I know now, Lord, why you utter no answer. You are yourself the answer. Before your face, questions die away. And um, apparently Robbie Dawkins had a similar experience, according to Simon Ponsonby in his book, Different. He had a visitation from heaven, and he, it was so vivid, he didn't know actually whether he was there in body or just there in spirit. But as he approached the Lord, he said, a torrent of questions tumbled out of him. All the theological problems and mysteries he didn't have any answers to. And rather than answer, the Lord told him to be quiet and listen. Be still and know that I am God. And be still in that context literally means quit warring. Just stop and just be in my presence. So the first truth to soak in is that God is high and lifted up. We've already sung it today. He's great and all-knowing. And God is God. Just look at the person next to you now and just say, God is God. So that's our first ingredient for soaking the fruit today. And the second ingredient is this simple phrase, we are human. And to believe that, we just need to remind ourselves about how we were made. Genesis 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. We were literally made from the dust. And God reminds us of this truth in Jeremiah, where he says, Israel, you are like the clay in the hands of the potter. And in that same passage, it says this, the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. That's the prerogative of the potter, isn't it? To shape and reshape the clay. But boy, is it painful when you're in the hands of the potter. It can really hurt. And yet, we are in good hands. Those hands that form us hold us lovingly, gently, firmly. It's all for him and his glory, and it's all for our good. We can be really reassured about that because scripture is full of the reassurances that we are in good, loving hands when we're being reshaped and reformed. I think of verses like, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick He will not snuff out. He will take our weakness, and if we let him, he will form it into something wonderful for his glory. I mean, he's counted every hair on our heads, hasn't he? He gathers us under his wings. So if that's you today, if you are on the potter's wheel, being shaped or reshaped, just be reassured that the hands that hold you are loving hands of glory. And if you are going through trial, well, our companion in suffering and walking humbly through through trial is Job. Here's the very first verse of the book of Job. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. I mean, Job just had everything thrown at him, didn't he? Disaster struck His business was destroyed. His children were destroyed. Um, Disease came upon him. He was covered in all sorts of horrible sores. His friends came to comfort him, but really just made him feel worse. And even his wife said to him, it's your own, his wife said to him, curse God and die. But he refused to curse God. He refused to blaspheme against God. 
and he refused to give up on his relationship with God. I mean, he gave God quite a tough time. And he basically ended up saying to God through chapters and chapters of, of, of reason, God, life's not fair. Why? And finally, in chapter 38, God replies to Job. And you can follow this passage if you like in your Bibles. It's Job 38, 2 to 7. This is what God says in response to Job's complaint. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. I mean, what's God saying there? I think he's basically saying, know your place. Know your place, Job. Contemplate my greatness. And if you want to spend a bit more time today contemplating God's greatness, I'd really recommend that you read the whole of that section, chapters 38 to 41. Job's response to this speech from God is to say, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. So what has happened here, I think, is that Job has got lower and God has got higher. And it's that space that we want to occupy this morning, that space of recognising how high God is and how low we are in comparison So Job shows us how to walk humbly through trial. God is in heaven and we are on earth, so let our words be few. So they're the two things to soak in this morning for our fruitcake, if you like, that's soaking in. And um, we're now going to go on to part two of how to make a fruitcake. And just warning you, this is the uncut version. Hello, well, it's the next morning, we've soaked the fruit overnight, and now we're ready to finish off the cake. And it's very simple. First, you take out the two tea bags that have been soaking in the fruit overnight, discard those, and then you very slowly add uh, one mug of self-raising flour, put it in slowly, sweet up. Oh, joy now! Brilliant, well done. Oh, you're in a good mood today, love. Ready for school? Right, now Lawrence is going to add one beaten egg. So Laurie, can you choose an egg from the, um, from the egg pack there, please? There's only one. There's only one, so choose that one. <laughs> Perfect. And tap, tap, tap. And then Two thumbs in. Up. Oops! That's okay. And give it a nice beat, Lawrence. Off you go. Be- beat it up. Well, yeah, get your arm out of the egg. <laughs> Oh, I'm out of the egg, love. I need you that boy. Okay, good darling. Um, we'll get you some kitchen roll. And... <laughs> Today? Oh, that's oh, she's crazy. She's crazy. Yes. Nuts. We're still going. No, I don't want that bit in there. Well, we're don't not doing it again, so let's carry on. <laughs> this is... Uh... Just stop it. And, and oh. So, we stirred in the flour. And now we're going to add the beaten up egg. Oh, Laurie, you've beaten that really nicely. Well done. Pour it in. That's wonderful. Oh, sure. And uh, Gil, won't you give that a big stir? Oh, your sister. And they found the TV legs. Pretty hair. Give it a really good stir, my darling. So that's all we've added is one mug of self-raising flour and one beaten up egg. Today, that's it. We give it a really, really good stir. Get right down to the bottom where some sugar might have gathered, Gil. And then we pop it all into this tub and bake it um, for an hour and a half at 130 in a fan oven, 130 or 115 in a normal oven. Okay, Gil, that's brilliant. Big stir, big stir. Pour it all in. 
bung it in the oven and you can have a delicious fruit cake to enjoy later. It was 8.20 on a school morning when we were trying to do that. So, uh, but I'm sure some of you have got similar scenes in your home. I, I really wanted to tidy it all up, but I, 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 James said, no, just show it as it is. So um, we added there two extra ingredients. I don't know whether you noticed in the sort of craziness of it, but self-raising flour and an egg. And in the same way, we're just going to add two more things very briefly. And we're going to ask Noah and Daniel to help us with this. Because in the Bible, Job, Noah and Daniel are actually upheld as the three most righteous men that ever walked the earth. And Noah, it says, was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Now, don't be uh, intimidated by Noah. The people of his time were pretty awful. And Noah did have some bad traits. He he tended to get drunk and get naked when he was drunk. So he he wasn't perfect. Um, But (laughs) he was a... People like looking at each other going, that's you. (laughs) Um, he um, He was a righteous man. And so when God told him that he was going to destroy the whole earth and to build a massive ark, he did it because he was humble and he was obedient. In fact, it says in verse 22 of chapter 6, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. He was obedient even though it made him look really stupid, even though there was absolutely no sign of rain. But God had told him to do something and he completely trusted God and he did as he was told. Now, whether it's a call from God to just walk in an area of obedience from the Bible, a normal thing like not committing adultery or not being disrespectful to parents, or whether it's about upping sticks and moving to a whole new country like Simon Gilbo or others, uh, missionaries, Nam, people we've heard of here, it's actually a question of whether we're going to do what we've been told to do. Walking humbly means we live God's way. And there are today many Christian churches who are um, fudging this issue of obedience and are saying, actually, we're just going to love God and do what we like. It's all about love. Well, actually, remember the fruitcake. Obedience and love are perfectly formed together. We can't love God without obeying him. That's what it means for God to be God and us to be here on earth. And I've got just so many examples of simple obedience. Um, You know, not long ago, seven years ago, we had our house refurbished. And the builder actually offered um, to let us pay some of it by cash, in cash, um, so that we didn't have to pay as much tax. And he said, I can save you £6,000 if you do it this way. Very tempting. But we didn't. And we said to each other, let's just see what God does. We're going to honour him. And God has more than paid us back in amazing ways. So I want to just say to you, if you're worried about money today, give God what is God's. Be obedient. And he, I mean, can I just get a yes? If you have had an area where God has been faithful to you in the area of finances, when you've honoured him, can you just give a yes now? So we want to stand with you if you're struggling on that issue today. We can pray a bit later. Secondly, Daniel. We're coming, we're nearly finishing now. Daniel walked humbly as he was chosen along with his three friends to be trained in the court of the king of Babylon. But there was a great problem. The chief official wanted to serve Daniel and his friends food that had been offered to idols and wine that had been poured out on the altar of the pagan gods. And Daniel resolved not to defile himself in that way. That's what the Bible says. So he's meant to speak to the chief official and they were eventually given vegetables, and guess what? They, were, they thrived even more than those who ate from the king's table, and they were greatly honoured. God honoured them because they honoured him. So resolving not to be defiled is a key aspect of walking humbly. How does that look in our culture? I mean, Jesus said all foods are clean, so that's not necessarily something we need to worry too much about. But what about TV and films? What about other things that are going in? What about magazines that we're reading? Are we obsessing about materialistic stuff or gossip or violence? What are are we looking at on the internet? What are the things that might be swaying us towards other gods? The gods of materialism, obsession with beauty, or other things in in our culture? What about witchcraft? 
Um, I remember being on a bus years and years ago. I was a teenager, and um, we were on a trip. And there was a girl there, with, and her mother said that she could read palms. And she was going around reading palms on this bus. And to my shame, I let her read my palm. And um, there was another kid on that bus, and she offered to do his, and he was sitting just in front of me. And I remember distinctly, I was only about 12, I remember hearing him say, no thanks, I'm a Christian, and we're not supposed to do things like that. But he didn't say it with any judgment, he just said it faithfully, and, and just with such a sense of not wanting to be defiled, but not letting that be a rejecting thing to that lady. And I just, I was struck with it then, I'm sure he's been really blessed. Whereas I let something in, and actually years later, when I developed a fear of the dark, that was one of the things that I had to have prayed off. I'm sure some of you have similar experiences. When we meddle with things in darkness, there are consequences. So resolving not to be defiled in any way is a very important aspect of walking humbly. But back to Daniel. Where did he get the courage and the readiness to respond to the circumstances in which he found himself? I believe the answer is in Daniel 6 verse 10, where we find him at home, in an upstairs room, on his knees which he did three times a day, as was his habit, praising and giving thanks to God. He got down on his knees. He humbled himself before the living and lifted up God, remembering that he was on earth and that God was in heaven. So he let his words be few. He was soaking every day in those foundational truths so that when the time of trial came, it was easy, it was clear, he knew what to do. And if we are trying to cope with trial without soaking in those foundational truths, praying and meditating daily on who God is, we are going to really struggle. So let's just remind ourselves then of the recipe. The recipe for walking humbly as we come to a close is firstly to regularly soak in those foundational truths that God is God and I am on earth and to walk in obedience to God's call, whether it be in a daily aspect of holiness or a big call to something specific and a rejection of idols. And I just had a sense that um, the Lord really wanted us to, res- to have some time to respond today. I'm just going to invite you now to bow your head or to kneel as you see fit and we're just going to briefly meditate on those truths we've talked about there.